Have you ever come to this place and you were at the end of your rope? Days confused. Bad stuff had happened all week. God seemed nowhere and you didn't understand what was going on nor how to cope with it. Have you ever been spiritually confused like that? Life can do that to you, but when it does, we need to know what spiritual resources God has provided for us to get us through such spiritual confusion. We've been talking about the spiritual discipline of worship through the study of the book of Psalms and the way self-sacrificial worship can benefit the life of a believer. Two weeks ago, you'll remember we looked at Psalm 1, which showed us that God's guidance and wisdom can come to us through the medium of worship. And last week, we looked at Psalm 23, where we saw that faith and confidence in God can be created and built up during times of worship. And now this week, we're looking at Psalms 12 and 13, which will teach us that worship is God's antidote for spiritual confusion and despair. Both Psalm 12 and 13 are classified by Old Testament scholars as laments. A lament is a psalm that begins with a cry to God for help in time of distress. A lament was composed as a vehicle for the experience of worship as a worshiper sought out God for answers to some kind of spiritual confusion they were in. Something bad had happened to them. They didn't know where to turn, so they would come to the temple and use a suitable lament to connect with God in worship, hoping that God would give them some clarity and bring them out of their spiritual confusion. During times of sacrificial worship, a lament would give spiritual guidance and psychological relief to the worshiper. The worshiper would come to God in the worship service confused, and through the vehicle of worship, using a lament, they would dialogue with God in prayer and receive consolation and direction. A person would come to God in worship disoriented and confused, but they would leave the worship service spiritually satisfied and fully oriented to God's will. So how does that work in worship? How does the lament work? Well, all laments in the book of Psalms are composed with a particular structure, if you study them carefully. And by noting how the elements fit together in this structure, we can see how a lament accomplished their purpose in worship to orient the confused worshiper back to God's will. And two good examples, and they're not too long, are Psalm 12 and 13, our text for today. You can see that all laments begin with a cry to God for help. This cry shows that the worshiper has come to the worship service spiritually confused and disoriented. For example, Psalm 12 begins with, Help, O Lord! There is no longer anyone who is godly. The faithful have disappeared from humanity. They utter lies to each other with flattering lips and with a double heart they speak. Here, obviously, the psalmist is greatly disturbed about the injustice he sees in the world. Perhaps something has happened like that to him or his family or someone else. So he comes to worship and he cries out to God to hold the ungodly accountable. Other laments expressed other kinds of spiritual disorientation with their cries of help. For example, our next psalm, Psalm 13, 1 and 2, we read, How long? Will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear the pain and sorrow in my heart? How long shall the enemy exult over me? In this psalm, the psalmist cries out to God in confusion, complaining that God is taking far too long to deliver him from his enemies. And so we can see from this kind of language in a lament that one reason we need to come to God and worship on a regular basis is to clear up any spiritual confusion we may have. When we come to this place each Sunday, the events of the past week may have been very hard to take and harder to explain, so that we come to God here in worship asking, what's going on? The confusion that compels us to come to God in this way varies. It may be to a sudden illness in the family. It may be to a marriage that is going through hard times. 
The confusion may be concerning a terrible feeling of inadequacy or aloneness due to the loss of a loved one. The confusion may stem from the fact that we've wandered away from God and we don't see him anywhere at work in our lives. The confusion that exists may be that life is just too hectic and stressful and we need to take time out, regroup, and figure out what's going on. All of these things can disorient us to one degree or another. We may feel that God is not doing his job properly. We may be tempted to say, Lord, this isn't supposed to be happening to me. You're supposed to protect me. You're supposed to heal my illness so that I can go on doing your work. You're supposed to provide for my family. You're supposed to make all my troubles go away. And because it might appear that God is nowhere in sight, our confusion puts a temporary barrier between us and God. Our spiritual confusion clouds our relationship with God, and it may call us, it may tempt us to call that relationship into question. Like the author of Psalm 13, we may come to God with a cry of confusion and of being let down. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? And so it is the spiritual disorientation that we often find ourselves in that compels us to come to God in worship in an effort to get some answers. The cry or the prayer of a lament is a means to check in with God to see what's going on. You will note that the tone of these cries or prayers for help in a lament are often quite negative. The psalmist is in spiritual confusion and they make no bones about telling God about it. At times we can even find in the lament accusations against God that he has not been faithful. The psalmist is never afraid of telling God about their real feelings, good or bad. The psalmist comes to the worship service ready to prayer, ready to wrestle with God over their concerns. Like Jacob wrestling with the angel in Genesis 32:26, the psalmist is prepared to wrestle with God all night echoing Jacob's words, I will not let you go until you bless me. When spiritually confused, we need to be ready to wrestle with God. We need to level with God and let him know our innermost thoughts, even if they are negative. God knows about him anyway, and he welcomes our honest feelings. We do not insult God when we talk that way with him when we're honest with him. He is not offended when we come to him in honesty. On the contrary, God welcomes it. The psalmist, the book of Psalms is full of this kind of language. God welcomes it. He accepts us in worship and in prayer just the way we are. Doubts, attitude, anger, confusion, negative feelings, and everything else. The language of these laments shows us that God does not want to silence our honesty by making us afraid to talk to him, or by making it so that we are not permitted to speak openly with him. God's purpose for our coming to him in worship and in prayer is so that he can mend our hurt feelings and answer our doubts, rid us of our confusion and redirect us, reorient us to his will. And God cannot do that unless we are honest with him. In the typical lament, the opening cry for help is always followed by a response from God that answers this cry. In most laments, this is omitted. The lament being a template for a worship service, it would only be what the worshiper says. What the priest would be saying on behalf of God would be another document over here somewhere within the worship service. It would be in their bulletin, if you will. So uh, normally you don't see a response from God. But the reason I pick Psalm 12 because you do. God responds to this psalmist with, because the poor, that is the psalmist and his community, are despoiled, because the needy groan, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will place them in the safety for which they long. The man came to God, or the psalmist came to God, saying, how long will the ungodly rule the community? And God says, not long. These laments show us that God is always in the habit of answering our prayers. 
Here he answers the psalmist opening cry concerning the lack of justice in the world by promising that he would now begin to act on behalf of the poor and the needy who have been wronged. These lines show us that God answers prayer. He may answer our prayers by saying yes, or not yet, or he may say no. But God always answers our prayers in worship. And in that answer, regardless of what it is, God begins the process of redirection, reorientation to get our minds and spirits back on the right track. We, have make, we may have come to God in worship with many needs and questions. We have been, may have been quite confused as to what was going on in our lives and what actions we should take. We may have been disturbed and bewildered as to why God has allowed these kinds of things to happen. But as he answers us, he helps us sort out our confusion and distress. God may not fully explain why things are happening the way they are. In fact, often he doesn't explain much at all. But in his response to our cry for help, we experience God's gracious and soothing presence, a presence that will melt our fears and confusion, a presence that brings about the peace of God, which passes all understanding. And so the final result of a lament ceremony is that the psalmist once again is at peace, having been reoriented to a right relationship with God. In a typical lament, the psalmist's prayer ends in a statement of assurance or a statement of prayer for a praise for God, acknowledging that God has heard his prayer and God has assured the psalmist that the answer is at hand. We read in Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7, how the psalmist has a completely different tone. He says, The promises of the Lord are pure silver, refined in a furnace. You, O Lord, will protect us. You will guard us from this generation forever. Or the ending of Psalm 13, verse 5. I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Using a lament in a worship service to connect with God, the psalmist has now come full circle. He entered worship with the fear that God had forsaken him. He used words like, How long, O Lord, are you going to forget me? But now after wrestling with God in prayer during worship, he concludes with words like, I will sing to the Lord, for he has dealt bountifully with me. The lament experience in worship in the book of Psalms shows us what worship can do. When sacrificial work up, when we empt, uh, worship, when we empty of ourselves, when we involve in sacrificial work up, worship, when we seek God and listen for God's answer, it brings about reorientation. Worship is a spiritual discipline whereby we come to God with concerns, with distress and confusion, and he answers our needs with his assurance, forgiveness, acceptance, and presence. And the final result, if we've done our job in worship, the final result, if we've emptied ourselves, the final result is that we leave the worship service with a heart that has been uplifted, renewed, reoriented, and put in right, right relationship with God, just like what we read in the Psalms. What worship can accomplish is kind of like a Story I know. Little eight year old boy. One Saturday night he woke up from his sleep and he went rushing to his mom's door, knocking on it, and said, Mommy, mommy, I see spiders everywhere. They're everywhere. He was deathly afraid of spiders. They're all over my blanket, they're all over my covers, they're all over me. I can feel them. There's spiders. What do I do, mommy? I got spiders everywhere. His mother got up with him, sat with him, and said, I don't see any spiders. What do you mean spiders? He goes, they're all over my bed. Look at my quilt. He had just gotten a Spider-Man quilt. And there were spiders everywhere. And they had come alive. And he was deathly afraid. He didn't know what was going on. And his mother began to think, you know, he began a new medicine that day. A new medicine, one of the side effects is for a day or two as your body gets used to it, you might have hallucinations. And this is what the little boy was doing. And so she sat him aside, 
explained. You're having, you're seeing things because the medicine, it'll be okay tomorrow night probably. You'll be fine. The spiders will go away. And the, and the little boy says, but no, 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 there's still spiders here. There's hundreds of spiders. And so the mother held the boy. She prayed with him. She sang little kid songs with him. She prayed some more. And throughout the night, he fell asleep in her arms on the couch. The next day he woke up and he was fine. He was happy. His mom said, what happened to all the spiders? He said, well, I had this dream last night. The medication makes you dream too. I had this dream last night and in my dream I saw these spiders coming at me and there was this man in a white robe with a broom knocking them away. And another spider would come and he'd whack it. Another spider would come and he'd whack it. No spider ever got to me. And I woke up. He was fine that day. The spiders were gone. He was reoriented. What can God do in our lives when we are in great spiritual confusion and yet still come to him in sacrificial worship each week? The next time the terrifying spiders of your worst nightmare come for you. In your distress and confusion, take it to God in prayer during worship. In this place. And tell him what you really feel. Through the spiritual discipline of worship, through the music, the prayers, the scripturing, the sermon, through the sacrificial worship of the living God here, just like in a lament ceremony. God will answer the spiritual confusion in your heart and in your soul in one way or another, and he will assure you that those spiders aren't going to come close. And you may find out what that little boy found, that God can do away with your confusion and reorient you to his will, maybe even wearing white and carrying a broom. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.